That's right. And who is this? Yes. That's Cousin Jeff. Yes. yes. <laughs> Jeffrey Dahmer is not just a person who decided to take life to fill his desire. There's more to it. He was a new form of human the world had not seen in modern times. It's not so much that Jeffrey just took life that is terrible. It's what he did in detail to his victims. He used his apartment as a butcher shop to display and eat his victims. This is Jeffrey Dahmer telling his secrets about his impulses and his victims. When we first find Jeffrey in his life, it's May of 1990. He just moved out of his grandmother's home he has already taken the life of five people. But now, he will be moving into the location that will ever be known as 924 North 25th Street, apartment 213 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. But as Jeffrey is moving out of his grandmother's house, there are some things she does not know about. And that's that Jeffrey has killed and disassembled two men and one teenage boy in her home. He has been hiding the parts of the bodies that he wants to keep in the house. This is an element that Jeffrey will continue to do and will come up again and again, which will explain the reason for killing and keeping the bodies and parts of his victims. When Jeffrey is in his grandmother's house preparing to leave, he has normal items one would have. Shirts, hats, jackets, baseball cards, things he wants to take to his new home, but he also has things that only he can take to his new home. When Jeffrey is living with his grandmother, his grandmother will eventually say that she wants him out of the house, essentially kicking him out. She complains that there's odors coming from his room and from her basement that have just appeared since Jeffrey moved in. She does not know what they are, but she says they're foul. In Jeffrey's room in his grandmother's house, he has a mannequin one that you would see in an apartment store. Jeffrey uses this to sleep with and do other things as well. But as Jeffrey has already had three other people to his grandmother's house, who he has murdered and disassembled, it's now time for him to leave. Jeffrey's father would come to his grandmother's house one day. He knew that things were going on with Jeff. He didn't know what, he couldn't explain it. He just knew he wasn't the Jeffrey of old. He always knew his son was different. There was just something more different. In Jeffrey's room, Jeffrey's father would find a case, a black hard shell case, that locked. It used to belong to his father, but Jeffrey has taken it for himself and taken his father's items out. But in this case, Jeffrey will use it for his own pleasures. He will put the head and genitals of one of his victims in the case to keep. As Jeffrey's father sees the case, he asks Jeff to open it. Jeffrey refuses and says, I can't open it. At this point, the two are having a heated conversation about opening up the case. And Jeffrey is becoming extremely angry and stern that he cannot open the case. And he apologizes to his father and says, I just can't. Jeffrey's father is probably thinking there's some kind of dirty magazines or something in the case. And he does not want his son to have them in his grandmother's house. So he tells his son, empty the case by tomorrow and let me see inside of it. And that would end the conversation. You have to understand Jeffrey's past that leads up to this point. Jeffrey has been caught several times for indecent exposure. He has been caught trying to lure underage boys to his home for money many times. We know that Jeffrey liked young boys and men that looked a certain way that he liked. As he would say, most of Jeffrey's victims, especially his later ones, were African American men in their 20s that were fit, but Jeffrey says it has nothing to do with their race. It was just that they had the body features that I wanted. It's obvious that Jeffrey is a gay man that does not realize it or wants to accept it. When Jeffrey is even asked, has he come to understand that he is attracted to the same sex? He says he still does not get it and that it has gotten him into a lot of trouble. When you see pictures of the crime scene 
of Jeffrey's apartment. Look on the walls of his apartment. You will see the same kind of picture hanging up. The picture shows a man's figure, allowing you to see his muscle on his body. These poses that you see on Jeffrey's wall, this is how he would place many of the bodies of his victims and take pictures of them. When looking back into Jeffrey's life, when he is a young boy, a child, his father would say he seemed like a normal child, although he was shy. But as he became older, there were things I started to notice. When Jeffrey is young, he is very curious about death, wanting to know more about it. He would start picking up animals off the side of the road that were already dead. He would take them into the woods, skin them, cut them open, and he said he would rub his hands through the organs, feeling the texture, and also he would keep some of the bones. Jeffrey said that this is something that he did a lot in his childhood, but it just progressed when he was a teenager coming into his sexuality. Jeffrey's father was a chemist. His father would bring him home things from work. This is how Jeffrey learned so much about acid at a young age and how he led himself to use it on dead animals. This is another key point in Jeffrey's unusual behavior as a killer. He does not find animals to torture and kill in awful ways as most serial killers. He's wanting and doing something much different. He's wanting the insides, the bones. This is a separation from most serial killer behavior. With Jeffrey now being in his teens, coming into his sexuality, he is so overwhelmed. Not only is he attracted to the same sex, but he is having thoughts of mutilation with bodies. This is when he would also be struggling with the thought of necrophilia. It's curious and weird to say, but the first two people that Jeffrey would ever murder went by the name Stephen. The first one being Stephen Hicks, age 19. This was the first murder Jeffrey would ever commit. It was not by accident, it was something he wanted and he thought of non-stop and he finally got an opportunity to act on it. In June of 1978, Stephen Hicks, Jeffrey would pick him up as a hitchhiker. He talked Stephen to coming back to his family home in Ohio, saying that his parents had beer in the home and they were away. Jeffrey says that when he has Stephen in the car, Stephen is talking about women. And Jeffrey says he knows if he makes any moves, he says anything towards Stephen, showing that he is attracted to him he will more than likely ask to be let go out of the car. When Jeffrey arrives at his parents' house, the both of them will drink and talk for many hours and listening to music. But Stephen will eventually say he has to leave, but Jeffrey, he asked him not to go. This is when Jeffrey says he will bludgeon Stephen to death with a 10 pound dumbbell. Stephen is now deceased and Jeffrey will take advantage of his body. But since Jeffrey has the house to himself for a few days, he will keep Stephen and put him in his bed that night and sleep next to him. The next day, Jeffrey said he would dissect the body, bury it in the backyard. A few weeks later, dig it up, cut it up, the parts that he had cut up trying to dissolve them in acid. What's left of the bones, he will break them up in the backyard and scatter them. This is the first murder of Jeffrey Dahmer. It will be a telltale sign of everything to come for the next 16. Going back to 1990, Jeffrey is in his brand new apartment. It's fresh, it's clean, it's ready to be lived in. But in the first three weeks of Jeffrey moving into his new apartment, he will purchase a Polaroid camera, making sure he buys the one that develops the film at home for obvious reasons. This camera will be the single big key point of evidence when Jeffrey is finally caught. In the same three weeks of Jeffrey being in his apartment, Jeffrey's not so much concerned of filling his apartment with luxurious things, new furniture, trinkets. Jeffrey knows exactly what he will be doing in his apartment. He's been waiting for this moment. Everything is premeditated at this point. He will buy saws, knives, acid, a drum to put bodies in, big pots for boiling large objects. He knows exactly what he's going to do to whoever he can get to walk through the door of apartment 213. Jeffrey would also have a job that would allow him to buy these things and afford his apartment. He took a job on third shift, working in a chocolate factory. In 1989, he was convicted of assaulting a minor, but he would keep his job through a work release program. But in no time, he will start hunting 
for his next victim. This is when Jeffrey's killing spree really takes off. He will find someone and murder them almost every 60 days, and towards the end, it will pick up at an even faster rate. But like most serial killers, becoming more sloppy, more undone, and willing to take bigger chances. On May 20th, 1990, the weather has turned for the worst, but Jeffrey would still go and find his first victim. His name would be Raymond Smith. It was barely a month before Jeffrey would find and bring Raymond back to the apartment. Jeffrey would ask Raymond to come back to his apartment for $50 of his time. When both men arrive at 213 Jeffrey's apartment, Jeffrey is shaken, his adrenaline is rushing. This is what it's all come to. Finally, he's alone in his own home with someone. He knows he can do whatever he wants for however long. He has been going over this for many weeks now in his head. He will quickly make Raymond a drink laced with almost 10 sleeping pills in it, pre-crushed, hidden, to easily drop in and stir. Raymond will drink it and pass out in no time. Jeffrey takes no chances and immediately strangles Raymond to death. He would then take advantage of Raymond's body that night, sleeping with it in the bed, holding it, and talking to it. The next day is when Jeffrey awakes and starts using his Polaroid to take pictures of Raymond's body in different positions. After he's done taking pictures of Raymond, he will take Raymond's body into the bathroom, set him in the tub, and it will begin. Jeffrey will start cutting up Raymond into different pieces that he wants to keep and ones that he does not want to keep. The next few days, Jeffrey will spend time working on Raymond's body, putting parts of it in acid, and the rest putting in pots on the stove, boiling the skin off. When he finally has the pieces he wants, the main one being the skull, he will take it, clean it, and spray paint it, and put it in his closet, along with of one of his last victims from his grandmother's house that he took with him. By the end of that week, Raymond is throughout Jeffrey's house in pieces. Jeffrey will find someone else to lure to the apartment to do the exact same thing to in just a short time. As Jeffrey is finding many different men to lure to his apartment, it's almost non-stop. Jeffrey says he cannot control himself. By the time Jeffrey has five bodies in his apartment, some of them still dissolving, and some of their body parts, completely down to the bone, arranged throughout the house to where the ordinary person wouldn't even notice a finger bone sitting on a shelf. With each victim, Jeffrey starts to bring in, one by one, he becomes more ruthless with the body, more ruthless with the way he kills. He's doing things that aren't even speakable in words. As he continues to pile up bodies in his home, the neighbors will start to complain of the foul smells coming from the apartment and complain to management. Jeffrey blames many different things, cooking, his toilet is clogged up, but Jeffrey is running out of room in his apartment. When you look at the layout, of Jeffrey's apartment. You see that it's very small. There's not a lot of room. He has his living room, his kitchen, where he will store many of the heads, hands, and other parts of his victims. You can also see when you walk into Jeffrey's apartment, when you immediately take a right, straight ahead is the bathroom, where he will butcher many of his victims in his tub. And then to the left is the bedroom. It's obvious to say that Jeffrey's apartment is full of unbelievable germs, bacteria, blood, pieces of bodies. It's simply a biohazard nightmare. Jeffrey will have 12 men in this apartment that he will murder and stored away in some way. And not to mention pieces of the other men that he took from his grandmother's house. With his barrel of acid and death, he empties it into the toilet, down the sink, wherever he can dispose of it. The smell 
The stench is something remarkably foul. But still, Jeffrey continues to bring more and more men to his apartment that will never leave. He's becoming even more abnormal, calling himself the devil, not even believing how sick and demented he is and how far he's willing to go with each new person. With all of Jeffrey's victims in the apartment, he will have pictures of all of them and he will store them in his top dresser, almost 100 pictures. Jeffrey had skull and bones of all of his victims, but he's keeping all the heads and bigger bones. Some he's taking down to the skull, but some he's simply keeping the flesh on and putting their heads in his freezer and refrigerator. Jeffrey would take one of his victims, cutting their hands off, their genitalia off, and their head. He would place it nice and neatly on a table and take a picture of it. The pictures that Jeffrey is taking of his victims, when you see them, your mind does not even understand what it's seeing. They are so foul and so gruesome that you have to be warned. Once you see them, they will never leave your mind. Jeffrey has turned his apartment into a killing factory. The more and more men that he brings in, the odors are building. He's literally bringing men into his home while he has their heads, hands, and his refrigerator. The one thing that Jeffrey is known for is that he ate some of his victims. Jeffrey said he would eat things such as the liver, the heart. He said he would try a calf off of a leg, but it was much too hard. He said he would buy a meat tenderizer and use it on one of his victim's torsos, almost like tenderizing a big piece of steak. He said when eating his victims, it made him feel like they would never leave him again, that they were a part of each other. When Jeffrey talks about this cannibalism, your mind is not separating from bad to worse to even worse to unbelievable. There's so many levels that Jeffrey will pass, going far beyond any serial killer has ever gone in recorded history. He has done and doing things that even the worst horror movies have never even thought of. Jeffrey is so obsessed with one of his victims that he will take their head with him to work, placing the head in his locker so he can see it on his brakes and then simply take the head home with him when his shift ends. By the summer of 1991, Jeffrey is completely out of control. His drinking is taking over to whatever remorse he may have had. It's no longer there. Jeffrey's life, his apartment, it's all ruined with the stench of death. Jeffrey will still push the limits and start doing something completely new. On some of his victims, when he gave them the sedatives and knocked them out, he would start drilling holes in their heads, calling them experiments. He would drill a hole in their head and then simply start injecting acid into the frontal lobe of the brain while his victim was still alive. Jeffrey was looking for some sort of stay alive state zombie, someone out of it, someone willing but not willing to do whatever he wanted at any time. His last few victims were just days apart, each one getting closer to the last one. On June 30th, Jeffrey killed. He left the body in pieces lying around his apartment, somewhat being lazy of taking care of it until he finally had to clean it up to lure someone else into the apartment. On July 7th, Jeffrey killed again, doing what he wanted with the body and then putting it in acid. Again, in July, on the 15th, Jeffrey killed again with this victim. He would again cut up the body, keeping pieces, including the head and the hands, in his refrigerator, which police will find in a short time. Then again, on July 19th, just two days after his last killing, with the apartment officially reeking like death, Jeffrey will lure his last victim back to his apartment, where he will kill them, cut them up, and do what he wants with the pieces. At this point, Jeffrey's killing rate is almost two in one week. All Jeffrey is doing at this point with his life is working, drinking, luring men back to his apartment, murdering them, doing unbelievable things to the bodies, 
cleaning as much as he can to lure the next victim in and then repeating the process. His obsession has taken over fully. But on July 22, 1991, just three days after Jeffrey has killed and dismembered his last body, he will bring what he thinks is his last victim to the apartment. The difference is, as Tracy Edwards walks into Jeffrey's apartment, he will be the only one to make it out alive. When Tracy is lured to Jeffrey's apartment, Jeffrey will immediately go over his whole routine, offering Tracy a cocktail, obviously laced with a massive amount of sleeping pills. When Tracy walked into the apartment, when he looked to the left, he saw these big boxes full of acid with a skull and crossbones over it. He asked Jeffrey why he had so many boxes of acid. Jeffrey simply said, I like cleaning bricks and I use the acid to do it with. The two would sit on the couch and Jeffrey would ask Tracy if he could take pictures of him now. That's how he lured Tracy there. Jeffrey said he was a photographer and he was going to pay Tracy $100 to do so. Tracy said not yet, so Jeffrey offered Tracy a drink, obviously laced. At this point, Tracy is becoming uneasy and it's becoming obvious that he wants to leave. He looks over at Jeffrey's fish tank and when he does so, Jeffrey those handcuffs on his left arm and pulls the knife out. Tracy would stay as calm as he could and try to talk to Jeffrey of why he was doing this. As Jeffrey was holding the knife to Tracy, he told Tracy to get up and come to the bedroom with him. Tracy said that when he got to the bedroom, the stench was even more foul. And when Tracy looked over in the corner, he saw it, a big blue barrel. He's putting two and two together, acid, the barrel, the stench of something dead in the apartment. He's becoming more panicked. Tracy has also seen things in the fridge. When Jeffrey would go to get beer, Jeffrey was so unbeknownst and drunk that he opened the fridge so big. When Tracy looked over into the fridge, he saw a man's head. And when they were in the bedroom together, Jeffrey would open up his black file cabinet and show Tracy a hand. Jeffrey would make Tracy watch The Exorcist for quite some time. At one point, Tracy would go to the bathroom and come back. Jeffrey would say, I want you to lay on the floor. They would both lay on the floor and Jeffrey would lay his head on Tracy's heart. They eventually got back up and went to the couch. And when Jeffrey wasn't looking, Tracy said he needed to go to the bathroom again. He got up, turned to Jeffrey, hit him, ran to the door, and Jeffrey would start trying to wrestle him back inside the apartment. But Tracy hit Jeffrey over the head hard, and Jeffrey went down to the ground. Tracy runs out of the apartment, down to the street, and just happens to see police driving down the road. He runs out in front of them, screaming and yelling with handcuffs still on him. Tracy tells the police right where Jeffrey's apartment is. They park, find Jeffrey running out, extremely intoxicated, and not even knowing really what's going on. The police will then walk back up to Jeffrey's apartment to search it and to get the key for the handcuffs. As the police enter Jeffrey's apartment, they are hit with an odor, but nothing yet has caught their eye. One of the police officers walks into Jeffrey's bedroom. He opens the top drawer of his nightstand and immediately is hit with unbelievable photos. He yells out to his partner, cuff him. It's done. At that point, Jeffrey has been caught there's no way he's getting out of this. As more police enter Jeffrey's apartment, one of them will open the refrigerator. He will later ask, who screamed in the apartment? Unbeknownst to him, that he was the one screaming. He opened the refrigerator to find a man's head staring right back at him with hands, genitalia, another head in the back of the refrigerator with more hands and organs wrapped up off towards the corner, a freezer full of human body parts as well. Jeffrey is taken to the station. He is becoming sober and realizing what is going on. He knows he's been caught and he does not hide anything. He will look at the detective with him and tell him, after I tell you what I've done, you're going to be famous. The detective chuckled and said, there's not much you can tell me that I haven't seen. Jeffrey looked back at him and said, you have no idea what I've done. With all of this breaking, it immediately becomes the number one news article in America and traveling throughout the world. Overnight, Jeffrey Dahmer is a household name. The cleanup on Jeffrey's apartment 
would take an enormous amount of time and money. The authorities would slowly start going through the apartment, finding body parts, organs half eaten. They would strip the apartment, taking everything for evidence. Jeffrey has essentially ruined the apartment. The stench of death has ran through the whole complex, and not to mention, into the pipes. Jeffrey's trial would last long. There was more evidence that was ever needed for a trial. It's obvious that Jeffrey is guilty. He does not hide anything. When Jeffrey is finally found guilty, he will say he's sorry and give his sympathy as much as he can in a Jeffrey Dahmer manner. There's not much hype. There's not much emotion. It's just Jeffrey. He is sentenced to almost 900 years in prison. When looking over Jeffrey's life, much of it is documented for a serial killer. We can see behaviors and how things may have started that turned into something no one saw coming. Things that caused radical behavior in Jeffrey, his parents' divorce, his obsession with death, not knowing how to handle being a young gay man, scared, afraid of it, anger building, things that build aggression in him, even his obsession with bodies. But one thing we can't explain is how Jeffrey's obsession with death took him to such a dark, disgusting place. There's one person throughout Jeffrey's life that would defend him and try to explain and understand what was going on with Jeffrey. It was Lionel Dahmer, Jeffrey's father. Lionel Dahmer would even write a book about Jeffrey, trying to explain how he viewed and saw his son growing up. Jeffrey would even be able to read the book and say there was things that he did not agree with fully, such as that Lionel said that Jeffrey was a very shy boy growing up, and Jeffrey said he wasn't shy, he was just a little more held back around his parents. To see your child go down this path of darkness and sickness, affecting so many people, Lionel would still stay by Jeffrey's side till his death. He would visit Jeffrey in prison and just have normal conversations, never talking about what happened in the apartment. Towards the end of Jeffrey's life in prison, he will come back to Christianity. Jeffrey will even be baptized by his minister. The minister would say things about Jeffrey like Jeffrey was somewhat like talking to a child in a grown man's body at times. He could be very excited, but then be very somber. If he was interested in something, he could talk about it for hours. Jeffrey's name around prison soon became JD. For the first time in Jeffrey's life, besides for the short time being in high school, Jeffrey is somewhat popular and has friends. He's well known in prison, but just like high school, there are people that like him and people that don't like him. It's said that while Jeffrey is in prison, he likes to pull pranks, pick on people, do funny awkward things, just like he did when he was a young man in school. Lionel Dahmer said for the first time, he saw Jeffrey becoming a human, reaching out to his family, talking, keeping up, laughing, being social, out of prison and in prison, taking an interest and in learning. In some weird way, he was normal now, but still, Jeffrey struggles with his thoughts that he's always struggled with, and there are still times where his impulse is so overwhelming it's hard to breathe. In August of 1994, Jeffrey will be attacked for the first time by an inmate with a knife. He was attacked in the church chapel of the prison. He was not hurt bad and was able to escape, but on November 29th, 1994, Jeffrey would go from being the hunter to the hunted. He will find himself a bad situation. Jeffrey is with three men. They are on cleaning duty. A man that is named Christopher will attack Jeffrey and the other inmate, killing both of them. Jeffrey will be beat over the head and die from his injuries. When Christopher is asked why did he murder Dahmer, he said he did not like Dahmer's sense of humor. It was morbid, it was weird, and he knew about his crimes. He just didn't like him. And just like that, Jeffrey is gone. He leaves behind hurt anguish in a place that psychologists and detectives are still trying to understand and study to this day. Jeffrey Dahmer is in his own category of serial killer. He went as far as you can go. Friends, thank you so much for being here till the end. We will more than likely talk about Jeffrey again in the future. There's still much more to go over. But friends, until next time, remember, be careful who you go home with. <laughs>